Well, hi, everybody. We're in week number two of a message series called You Can Do This. Can we say that together? You can do this. And uh, one of the things that I do love today is you kind of look around the room. Uh, many of you have shifted service times, and so you can say you can do it. You did it. And uh, the reason we added services uh, over the last couple of weeks is to make more space to impact more people. We've been full on Sunday mornings, and so it's been encouraging. God has been doing some incredible things in our church family. And if you just attend Lake Forest, you may not know this, uh, our church is 20 locations. Uh, 15 of them are spread across Southern California, and five of them are international campuses. And God has been moving very powerfully the last couple of weeks. We had our big block party, and the international campuses are one week behind what happens here in the States. And last weekend with their block party, uh, our five international campuses on four continents had over 4,000 people show up for their block party. So we can celebrate that. And in addition to that, the thing that I'm most excited about just the last two weeks alone as we've been starting this new message series uh, and we had our block parties, there have been 420 people that have indicated first-time decisions to follow Jesus with their life. And so we celebrate that. And I want to say thank you, those of you who are serving on teams and praying God's using your life in a very powerful way. Today, as we are continuing our message series, this series is a series of hope. We're looking at the reality that because God is for us, our lives can be transformed. And when you consider your life, you know, there are places and times in your life where you get stuck, there are things that happen differently than you expected, and sometimes our experience in life, the things that we're not good at or the mistakes that we make become a narrative in our life. And we tell ourselves stories that really do guide and direct our direction in life and keep us stuck at the same place. And one of those narratives, for me, comes out of an experience in my home a couple years ago. Now, my wife Stacy is amazing at a lot of things. She's a great teacher of the Bible, she's a great leader, she's an incredible woman of God, and she is also an amazing chef. And every so often, Stacy will include me in her process of cooking food for our family. And on one particular occasion, uh, Stacy said to me, she said, hey, I've made everything for dinner except for the rice, and I just need your help with the rice. All you have to do, you turn on the eye of the stove. I've actually already measured out the rice and the water, and it's ready to go. All you have to do is turn on the eye of the stove, and when the water starts to boil, you turn it to simmer, and you just wait. That's all you have to do, just wait. And so she leaves, and I'm feeling great, I've got this, you can do this. And so I turn on the stove, I let it boil, the stove top boils the water with the rice in it, I feel great, I turn it to a simmer, I walk away, and then I start thinking about the rice. And I'm wondering, maybe I should go check on the rice. So I go back over after about five minutes and I pull it open and I stir the rice. I take the lid off and it's a little crunchy. I'm like, well, certainly it's fine. It's got time to cook. So I put the lid back on. So I walk away for another five minutes. I want to be faithful with this responsibility. So a few more minutes go by. I go back to check on the rice again. I take the lid off. I stir the rice. It's still crunchy. I do this about four or five times. I'm really troubled, but I don't want to call Stacy and ruin her afternoon. I'm just going to wait till she gets home. So finally, she walks in with the lid on the rice, opens it up to look, and she's like, why is the rice crunchy? And I said, I don't know. I've been here doing my job for the last 40 minutes, and it ended up crunchy. And she's like, you've got to leave the lid on. All you had to do was wait. That's all you had to do. Anybody ever ruin rice just out of curiosity? Okay, thank you. Now, if you don't know about rice, you're supposed to leave the lid on and it needs the steam to cook. I have ruined rice and there's other things in my life that I've messed up. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, there are stories that we could all tell, things that we've done, places in our life where we messed up, and sometimes those mess ups become a narrative that we tell ourselves. And there are things that you might believe about yourself that are not true, that it could never be different. Maybe you messed up a marriage. Maybe you found yourself in a place where you messed up your family's finances. Maybe you had the killer job and you made some bad choices and you messed up the job. And wherever you are, whatever your struggle is, whatever it is with your life that you've messed up, 
there is hope for you today. And what I want to communicate loud and clear from the pages of the Bible, this is the message of the day. Because God is for you, you can be restored. Because God is a God who is for you, there is the possibility of restoration with every single one of our lives. And today we're gonna continue our journey looking at the theme of restoration from Psalm 23. I love this Psalm. As we're journeying together, we're also, as a church family, going through this wonderful old book called A Shepherd's Look at the 23rd Psalm. All of our small groups have these. Today, if you sign up for a small group, we'll give you one. Uh, you can actually sign up through the app today and we'll get that book to you and you can be a part of one of our small group communities as we're journeying together, Psalm 23. And today as we do, we're gonna read it aloud. So I'd like to invite you to pull out your notes. Uh, you can find it on the app or there's a physical copy in front of you. Locate your notes. We're gonna read through Psalm 23 with a big, hearty 11.30 a.m. service voice. You guys ready? Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of God, and it's so rich. I love this psalm. It's certainly one of the most famous poems written in all of human history. And one aspect of that is because it's God's word that's been sustained and delivered into our lives, but it's also so beautiful and rich because King David, who was the second king of the nation of Israel, was a shepherd. So certainly, he would have spent hours on end watching sheep in fields. And he understood the nature of the relationship that God wants to have with us as humans. And he describes that relationship so beautifully here that for all of us, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're new to this whole journey, this psalm is communicating what is possible with God in your life and what God desires to do in your life. And today I want us to focus in on that phrase that David says, he restores my soul. Now, as David is leading into the phrase, he restores my soul, I want you to notice how he gets to it. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Because of that, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And this imagery is of a shepherd with a sheep that needs rest. And the good shepherd forces that sheep to lay down. And there are some of us that we can honestly say we, we need from time to time somebody to force us to rest. And God is able in our craziness to bring rest to our lives. In addition to that, uh, he says that he leads me beside quiet waters. So he brings refreshment. And there are times in our lives where we need nourishment from God. So as a good shepherd, he does this. And then David gives another phrase. He says, he restores my soul. Now if you go all three of those phrases... The third phrase doesn't have as much imagery in the English language, and for us, we don't understand it the way David would have understood it. And when he uses the phrase, he restores my soul, David would have had in his mind images of sheep. And sheep are always doing crazy things. They are getting stuck in places, they're biting one another, and David uses the word he restores my soul. It's an image, the original word means to put or return back to its rightful place. And sheep oftentimes get into places they should not be. So I want you to see just a quick video of a sheep that finds itself stuck. A shepherd walks up. Uh, maybe the son of the shepherd pulls the sheep out. Oh, I'm free. I'm liberated. I'm running. Three, two, one. Now I'm back in the same ditch. And that picture, somebody just said, that describes my life. <laughs> and we get free, and then we're back in the same situation. And sometimes we get stuck. David is communicating that God is a God who restores us when we find ourselves stuck. And in his mind, 
this image of restoration would have been connected to sheep getting cast. And there's an idea that he would have understood sheep oftentimes find themselves cast. He said in Psalm 51, 11, he uses that phrase, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. So David had in his mind the image of a cast sheep. Now I want you to see what a cast sheep looks like. This is a cast sheep. This is a sheep that's stuck on its back. And unfortunately, this sheep, without intervention, cannot get up. It's not like a dog that can roll over and flip back up, or a cat that can flip back up. It is stuck on its back without intervention. Uh, actually, the gases will build inside the sheep's stomach and it will explode, it will die, or a coyote will come and eat it, a mountain lion will come along and I'll stop before it gets too gory. But that sheep has no hope unless a shepherd or someone comes and restores it. Now, it's fascinating why sheep get cast. Now, when they're cast, there's a couple things. One, they're flipped upside down. Two, they're stuck. Three, they're helpless. And four, they're in danger. So they're stuck in a place where if somebody doesn't intervene, they're gonna, they're gonna die. And that image is so powerful of how we find ourselves so often. And David, as he's describing this, he would have known why sheep get cast. So there's several reasons why a sheep will get cast and flipped upside down. And I could preach on these three things. I won't spend a lot of time, but it will help us as we walk through the rest of the message. One, sheep will seek comfort in the wrong places. So a good shepherd will take a sheep out and in the grass there might be a little ditch and the sheep is trying to lay down and it will lie down in the wrong place and it will get cast because it sought comfort in the wrong place. Sheep also will be overgrown and dirty. So an overgrown, matted wool coat is an invitation to get cast. So the sheep will get wobbly, and as the sheep gets wobbly, it's flipped on its back. And then third, sheep will get overweight and unhealthy, and when they get overweight and unhealthy, they're, they're liable to cast. So an overgrown, overweight sheep is headed towards destruction. Now, all of those images really do play out in our lives. And there's a lot of Christians that they consume, 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 and never exercise their faith and they're like fat sheep that are cast. You could say the same about the, the dirtiness in our life that we get cast, but the good news that for all of us, that God wants to enter into that journey with us when we're cast and restore us. Now today as you consider restoration in your life, you have a view of God that is determining your approach to him. And I wanna invite you to write that phrase down. Your view of God is determining your approach to him and your response to him and his desire to restore you. And the invitation today is to receive from the good shepherd who's able to rescue and restore our lives. Psalm 56, David would also write, he would say, for you have rescued me from death. You've kept my feet from slipping. So now I can walk in your presence, O God, in your life-giving light. So God is a good shepherd who's both a rescuer and a restorer. God rescues us in a moment and he restores us over a lifetime. So the invitation from the living God who's a good shepherd is for the rescue of our souls to receive salvation and it's for a lifelong journey of restoration. And what happens for many people is they'll make a decision to follow Jesus, they'll be rescued from sin, they'll enter into a relationship with God, but never fully be formed into the person that God's created them to be. And I believe in many ways the reason why we stay stuck over and over and over again with habits, with areas of our life that God wants to transform is because there are lies that the enemy will breathe into our minds and our hearts that leave us at a place outside of the grace of God. So we believe these lies and we never enter into the kind of freedom and restoration that God wants to bring to our lives. And I wanna identify three of them, and you'll find this in your notes. The first lie is this, the lie that I don't need to be restored. And there are a lot of people in our community, like you're, you're doing great, got an awesome job, got an awesome marriage, you know, things are, your kids get straight A's, and deep in your heart you feel fine. Maybe even you come to church every week and you kind of do the thing and you're living the wonderful Orange County life and everything is awesome, 
for you in your mind, but it's possible that you think you're doing fine, but you're headed towards destruction. And I want you to see this image one more time, if we can look at this cast sheep. Now there's no way to fully know what's happening in that sheep's mind right now. But it's very possible that that sheep just thinks it's sunbathing. It's very possible that he's just waiting for belly rubs. And he does not know that he is headed towards destruction unless there's intervention. And what God does in our lives is God, in his grace and mercy, will bring us to a place of recognition of our need before him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, the Apostle Paul would say, if you think you are standing firm, be careful then that you don't fall. And whenever we find ourselves thinking, I'm fine, I've got it figured out, we are headed towards destruction. The Bible says that pride is a heart condition that ruins our lives. And the invitation and the entryway into the kingdom of God is through what Jesus would call a poorness of spirit, a humility before the living God, that without God's grace, without God's mercy, all of us are headed towards eternal destruction. The price of sin, the sentence of our brokenness should be eternal separation from the living God. And it's not a matter of good or bad. It's not like some people are good or so, and some people are bad. It's a matter of life and death. That the Bible says because the penalty of sin and the decision of our heart to go wayward from God, that without God's grace, we are dead spiritually. But God would step into our place and Jesus would take our sin on a cross so that we could be forgiven. He would conquer the grave so that we could be restored. And it requires for all of us to come to a place of recognition that we need a savior. The Bible calls this word repentance. And the way out of the ditch is to repent for getting myself into a ditch. To acknowledge, I, I have messed my life up. I've made a decision or decisions that have harmed me and other people around me. And repentance is turning from our sin towards God. To say, God, I need you. I'm sorry for the choices that I've made. And that phrase for some of us is so hard to say. I wonder if we could say it aloud together. I'm sorry, just say, it. I'm sorry. You didn't say it. Maybe it's that hard. Let's say it together. I'm sorry. And that phrase, those words are so powerful. I'm sorry. I need your help, God. I've created a mess. I've put myself in a situation that I can't fix in and of myself. And that recognition that we need God's rescue and restoration is the entryway. It's the beginning of God's restoration for our lives. I love the story of John Newton, who was alive in the late 1700s. John Newton was radically transformed by the grace of God. He had an encounter with the living God. He was on a ship, he was heading from Great Britain down to Africa, he was a part of the slave trade and he would trade slaves. And he's, he's sitting there on a ship, the grace of God comes along and reveals to him things he's heard before but the understanding clicks, I need a savior. John Newton surrenders his life to Jesus, comes back to Great Britain, was so convicted of his sin, makes a decision to be a part of the abolitionist movement and is used by God to eliminate slavery in Great Britain. And he, is, he does this out of his transformation of God's grace. And he writes a song that you might have heard before called Amazing Grace. And John Newton, he would say some very powerful, beautiful things. I want you to hear just a couple of his quotes. I love these. He says, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I hope to be in another world. I'm still not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I love the humility in this, this man that has been greatly used by God. And the last quote I wanna leave you with from him is on his deathbed, as he's breathing his last breath, he says this. He says, although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. One, I'm a great sinner, and two, Christ is a great savior. And my, my hope, the longer I follow Jesus, is that my recognition of my need would grow. And to see how desperate I am for a savior. I'm a great sinner, 
and need of a great Savior. And that's the, that's the entryway to receive more of God's grace in your life. He's looking for humble people that will recognize they need him. Psalm 51, 17, King David says this, the sacrifice you desire, it's not coming to church more, the sacrifice you desire is not checking all the religious boxes. The sacrifice God desires is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. So the invitation from God is to come in a spirit of repentance. I'm sorry, I need your help. And I wonder today if you might be honest with yourself. Be honest with the people in your life to say this is an area that I've gotten myself into a ditch and I need help. I need help from others and I need help from God. That lie that you don't need help will keep you stuck. But there's a way forward. It's through repentance. The second lie is that it's too painful and not worth it. So this is a lie that says, you know, the process of restoration is too much work. It's too hard. And we all know people who've gone through a journey of restoration. You know somebody whose marriage has changed. You know somebody who lost the weight. You know somebody who's gotten healthy mentally again. You know somebody who's gone through a process. And in doing so, you might look at them and say, I, I don't want that. That's not what I want. Because it takes so much energy and it's so hard. And there is a before and after that God wants to bring about in our life. But that before and after involves pain and a process. So for a shepherd, in his mind, he would have known what it would look like to see an overgrown sheep. And I want you to see one of them here on this picture. The one on the left is a sheep who is lost. His wool is overgrown. It's matted. And it's good to know that this is painful. It's painful. I mean, I've never had an overgrown wool coat, but I could imagine there's a lot of pain for this sheep in the midst of that. Now, the good shepherd found this sheep, and the sheep on the right is the same sheep as the sheep on the left. And now that sheep has a before and after picture. And imagine what that sheep felt like when the good shepherd came up with a pair of shears to trim its wool. Now, if you saw somebody coming towards you with these shears in hand, <laughs> if you saw me coming towards you, you might wanna run because I have never sheared a sheep before, nor a human. And shearing requires a level of skill. And this could be a really bad thing in the wrong person's hands. But in, listen, in the good shepherd's hands, these shearers can become an instrument of love. So God, in his mercy, will train us, form us, and shape us. And the choice we get to make is what pain do we want to endure? Do we want to endure the pain of the good shepherd forming and shaping us? Or do we want to endure the pain of regret staying in the place that we've created for ourselves with our choices? See, God is not just a good shepherd, but he's also a good father. And in the Bible, the book of Hebrews describes this journey of restoration and healing and training that God does and notice what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, endure, hardship is discipline. So difficulty that you're walking through right now can be a part of God's bigger plan for your life to form you and shape you, your before and your after. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Somebody says, I know some. If you're not disciplined though, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters, at all. So parents have a responsibility and an authority before God to train their children, to love them, invest in them, to discipline them. It's not the school's job. It's not the church's primary responsibility. It's a parent's role to train and love and invest in their children. And what this, this writer is saying is God is the same with us. He is one who is training us as a father trains his children. And he does this out of love. Moreover, we all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we might share in his holiness. So God's training has a purpose in our lives. Verse 11 says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness 
and peace for those who have been trained by it. So the writer of Hebrews is saying there is a choice that we make, and the choice is whether or not we will endure the process that God is inviting us into, the process of transformation. The decision is to resolve to endure the process of transformation. There are so many people in their journey spiritually, it gets a little bit hard and they quit. And they miss the fullness of God's grace into their life to form them and shape them to become the person he's created them to be. Transformation is a process. It takes years. And sometimes it feels like it takes way longer than we want it to take. But one thing I know after 25 years of vocational ministry and watching literally thousands of people's lives, and you know this too if you've been around the block a few times, you know that it is so much easier to endure difficulty when you're a part of a community, when you're a part of a church family. See, God puts us in physical families and he also desires that we would be a part of a church family. And here as a church family, our deep desire and prayer for you is that whatever you're walking through, whether it's divorce, whether it is, it is in a, you're in a place of great depression, you're in anxiety, maybe you're in a strained relationship with a child, maybe there's a habit you can't overcome or you feel like you can't, we as a church family wanna come alongside of you to do everything that we can to help you in that process of transformation. That's why we do everything that we do, but one area that is so important for you to know about, we have a great team of people that work in our ministry of care. We have groups that meet together for help with recovery, support groups, we have counselors that they're, they're trained and ready to meet whatever you're walking through at this point, and today you can get connected to a community of care that will walk through your struggle with you. In fact, in your notes, there's a, little, there's a website in your notes that you can go to and you can find help. You can, you can go there today, you can click on the links there, and this week be meeting with somebody one-on-one -on -one that can help you in the midst of your pain. The other place that I believe is a great starting point in a restoration journey is Celebrate Recovery. Every Friday night at our Lake Forest campus, I think there was somebody that wanted to shout, so we'll, we'll go. Yeah. Every Friday night uh, here at our Lake Forest campus, we have Celebrate Recovery, and it's really designed to help when there are hurts, there are hangups and habits in our lives that we, we struggle to overcome. And something about being in community, as you heard Shirai's story earlier today, that in that community, whatever your need is, it's not just substance abuse, there are people that are walking through hurt and pain from their past, and they need a community to help them. In Celebrate Recovery, we talk about a process of restoration, and there's an invitation to take a step to get into community, join a small group, be a part of our care ministry, but let us come alongside of you to wrap our arms around you with God's love so that you can grow and be restored. The enemy wants you to believe a lie that when it's hard, you need to leave, when it's hard, you should isolate, but God is speaking, saying, no, when it's hard, come into community and endure and let me transform your life with my grace. Lie number two is it's not worth it. Lie number three, I wanna finish with this. God can't do it for me. And many times in our journey, we watch other people's lives be transformed. Maybe you've seen somebody that God intervened on their behalf, you've watched places of their life be transformed, and you think to yourself, God could do it for somebody else, but he can't do it for me. And what I would say to you is, from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end, this book is declaring God's personal ability to love and care for you. He's a good shepherd. He knows all your worries. He knows all your anxiety. He knows everything that you've struggled with for years on end, and he is able as the living God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, to enter into our lives and bring restoration to any area of your life where you find yourself stuck today. He is a good shepherd. John 10, 10, Jesus is speaking and he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. There is a, there's a real enemy called Satan that is trying to destroy your life. And he's trying to get you to believe that God is not for you. And Jesus would say, I, I have come that they might have life 
and have it abundantly. And then he follows it up with a statement, I am the good shepherd who lays down my life for his sheep. Jesus has laid down his life for you so that you can be restored. He took the ultimate penalty of sin on himself after living a perfect sinless life so that you and I can be reconciled back to the heart of God, be brought into relationship and healed through that relationship. And the choice that we get to make, that we need to make to receive from him, is the decision to receive his personal care for each and every one of us. It's a decision to say, God, I, I need your care and I believe that you're able to care for me in my struggle. You're able to care for me in my addiction. You're able to care for me in my fear. And the truth of God's word speaks into our lives that all of that we can bring to him. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I want you to hear that loud and clear today. He cares for you. The living God, the creator of the universe, knows you by name. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every day that you will live. He watched you as you were being formed in your mother's womb, and he has a good plan for your life. He can take the worst of situations and circumstances. He can take royal messes and turn them into beauty if you'll bring your life before him today. And the invitation from the Bible, as you see over and over and over again, God is restoring people's lives. God can take guys like King David, who was an adulterer and a murderer, and restore his life. God can take people like the Apostle Paul, who was a murderer of, murderer of Jesus' followers before knowing Jesus and afterwards becomes one of the greatest proponents of the message of Jesus in human history. And God is able to restore. I want in the last few minutes that I have remaining to do everything I can from deep within my soul to your soul to convince you that no matter what your situation is, it might be adultery, it might be pornography, it might be anxiety, it might be bankruptcy, whatever your situation is, there is a God, the God, that can restore you. And I wanted, I wanna do everything I can to show you from God's word that he is a restorer. There are so many different things in our lives that we might believe he could never restore, but he can do it. He says it over and over and over again through the pages of scripture. And I'm gonna give you just a few of them. One, God can restore hardened hearts. God can take a heart of stone and in a moment through the power of the Holy Spirit make that heart soft as his truth goes deep within our souls. Ezekiel chapter 36, the prophet would speak on God's behalf. He would say, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit inside of you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. He's able to take hard hearts and make them soft. Not only is he able to soften our hearts, he's able to take lives that, that are at a place of great sadness year after year after year. And he's able to restore to you joy that comes from relationship with himself. He's able to give missing joy. And some of you, you've been going for years on end. It went from grief into perpetual sadness. And God is saying, in him there is joy that he can restore. Psalm 51, verse 12, King David would say, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. He understood that when life is stacked against you, if you understand that God is for you and that he's a rescuer, God will bring joy to your heart that's beyond your circumstances. He is a restorer of joy. He's a restorer of broken families. He's looking throughout the course of the world and he sees all the havoc that the enemy is trying to reap on nations and families and he's trying to bring de destruction and division and all kinds of confusion, but God is mending what is broken. He's a reconciler through the cross. It's a vertical and a horizontal reconciliation that families that have been torn apart for decades can be healed because of the grace of God. He's a restorer of broken families and at the end of the Old Testament, as the Messiah is coming and there's a prophet in the spirit of Elijah coming, there's one phrase. This is how the Old Testament ends. I love this. Malachi 4.6, when he comes, 
When the, when the fullness of God's kingdom comes, this is what will happen. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. He's a restorer of family. Some of you lost hope for your marriage, lost hope for your kids, and God wants to give you this deep sense of hope within your soul. He's a restorer of families. He can restore your health. He can restore your physical, mental, spiritual health, emotional health. He can use a process to bring you back to your rightful place. He is a restorer in terms of brokenness internally. He can heal you. Jeremiah 30, 17. The prophet speaks, I'll give you back your health and I'll heal your wounds, says the Lord God Almighty. He wants to come alongside of you and bring healing. He can restore not only just your health, but God can look at our lives. And there have been years, some of you, you have years of regret. There are seasons of your life that you can't even remember because there was so much shame and so much regret, you've just blocked it out. But the good God who created you and knows you, he's a restorer of lost years in your life. Joel chapter two, verse 25 says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. He restores the lost years of our life. I'm so thankful that we have a God that is actively engaged in every single one of our lives. He so deeply loves you. He is for you and not against you. And the enemy is doing everything he can from the beginning of the Bible through the end. He's trying to get us to believe a message that God is not for us. But God is declaring with arms stretched wide on a cross that he is for us and not against us. And the Apostle Paul, who had this radical transformation, would make this statement. And I'm going to finish with these verses. Romans 8, 31. He would say, what then shall we say in response to all of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? He who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one that condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So every moment of every day, the living God, the one who came and died in our place, the one who conquered the grave, the Son of God, he's at the throne of the Father and he's praying for you. He's saying your name. He's bringing your situation before the Father. How much more can God declare that he is for you he is for you and with you, and he is able to restore you. And the invitation is to bring all those broken pieces to the throne of God's mercy and grace. I'm so thankful to be a part of a church family where for over four decades there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of lives of people who have come. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to come with all that mess. Where else would you take it if you can't bring it to the church? Where else would you go with it if you couldn't go to God and the invitation is to bring all of that and watch as God has done over and over again in our church history bring restoration to your marriage to your soul to your mind to your body to your finances to your relationships God can restore you he can he's a great rescuer and restorer. and I want to invite you if you will between you and the living God just to do business right now in this moment. I'd like to invite you to close your eyes and bow your head. And I wanna just go back through those lies. The lie that says, I don't need help. Some of you right now, the invitation is just to say, oh God, I'm sorry. I do need your help. Just tell him, where's that area that you need his help? Second lie, that speaks that it's not worth the pain. And some of you are right smack in the middle of a really hard situation. And you might just come before God right now in this moment and say, God, give me the strength to endure. God, give me the strength to endure this pain. And finally, that last lie that says, he can't do it for you. You might just ask him to grant you the grace to believe 
deep within every fiber of your being that he is for you. And some of you, as we're praying these prayers, if you're honest with yourself right now, you don't have certainty that you have relationship with the good shepherd. By faith in Jesus who died on a cross for your sins, who conquered the grave, by rendering and giving your life to him, surrendering to him right now in this moment, relationship between you and God can begin. And I wanna invite you right now to pray a prayer of surrender before him. It's the spirit of the living God is taking hard hearts and softening them. Right now in this moment, this is a moment of salvation. This is a moment of yielding your heart to God. There's nothing more important than this decision that you would open your life to God right now. And right where you are, you can say to God, deep within your soul, God, I need you. Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. I believe that you conquered the grave and that you're alive today. I wanna ask you to forgive me for my sins. I wanna say I'm sorry for the decisions that I've made. And I wanna surrender my life to you the best that I know how. And in this moment, he's stepping in. You're being made new. You're being transformed on the inside. Father, I'm so thankful for salvation, for the rescue and restoration that you bring to our lives. You are better than we can fathom. You're kinder than we can imagine. You're more faithful than we can comprehend. And we want, as your children, as your sheep, to receive every bit of help that you have to offer us. In Jesus' name, amen.